She's like a sickness in my brain Vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and attacks me a lot of allegedly's and in my opinions in this video because I don't want to disappear. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Coffee and Crime Time and today we're talking about Jeffrey Epstein. There is so much to Jeffrey Epstein and his life and his crimes and his friends and associates and there's just like a twisted web of lies and deceit and sickness when you're talking about Jeffrey Epstein. And I really couldn't cover it all in, in a coffee and crime time. And I'm not really trying to put all my efforts into making a really um, in-depth video or videos about Jeffrey Epstein. First of all, because I would get lost. I would get lost in the labyrinth of Epstein's life and lies. And additionally, I feel like every video that you make about Jeffrey Epstein is like immediately demonetized. So for me to pour all my effort into that, it would be fruitless. It would be really difficult. It would be really difficult to untangle that. So you guys can do your own research and I'm gonna put some sources in the description box for you to just kind of click on and look through. I do wanna say, and you do with this information what you will, to find a lot of this stuff about Epstein, the stuff that got a little deeper and didn't just scratch the surface, I had to use Yahoo search instead of Google search. Whatever that means, you, you pick it up or put it down, but I'm giving it to you. So when we're talking about Jeff Epstein, we're going to state some facts, undisputed facts. That way we can go off of those facts and I can kind of tell you what I think about it a little bit. Then you guys can kind of tell me what you think about it. So let's, let's talk about some facts. Jeff Epstein, before he took his own life this month, he was an incredibly rich, wealthy, like filthy rich kind of man. And um, he owned a big, ginormous, ginormous house in Manhattan. He owned, I think, a couple of houses in Florida. And he owns his own island. And we'll talk about the island in a little bit. He also owns a couple planes, private jets, you know, you know, the, the normal filthy rich billionaire kind of thing. But nobody could really figure out how he'd made his money. It seemed like Jeffrey Epstein was uh, managing money for other filthy rich men. Even though he had no background or experience in managing or investing money, he somehow managed to get several extremely rich men to hand over their money to him and say, here you go, take care of my money for me and do with it what you will. Back in 2008, Jeffrey Epstein pled guilty to solicitation of a minor and he was sentenced to, I believe, 18 months, but he only served 13 months. Now, let's just unpack that really quick. Solicitation of a minor. So basically, he had relations with a child, an underage female, and he was sentenced to, I think, 18 months, but he only served 13. And how did he serve his sentence? This is very interesting. He served his 13 months with a work release. So basically he was given the permission to leave the jail or the prison and like go and work at his office outside of the prison. Six days a week, up to 12 hours a day. The sheriff's office, who allegedly had to put in quite a bit of overtime in order to make this happen, they received $128,000 from Jeff Epstein's own not-for-profit agency in order to compensate them for this overtime. So Epstein, while out of the prison, would have been monitored by deputies who were being paid for by him. While he was in prison, his cell door was left unlocked. 
he was allowed to have visitors and was able to meet with these visitors in a separate room with the door closed. Obviously, a lot of people were like, well, that's a very lenient sentence for a man who had relations with an underage child. What's up with that? Well, Alexander Acosta, who was the Florida Attorney General at that time, he said that he was told to back off of Epstein. He was told that Epstein belonged to intelligence and he should leave it alone. Basically, this is above your pay grade, so just do what we tell you to, allegedly, in my opinion. That's what he was told. He did say that he was told that Epstein belonged to intelligence and to leave it alone, but I added in the, it's above your pay grade, just do what we tell you, because that's how I imagine it went down, but in no way am I saying that that is what was said, allegedly. So this happened in 2008, why are we talking about it now, right? Because in July of this year, so last month, Jeffrey Epstein was arrested again. Since his 2008 arrest, many other women had come forward and made allegations against Epstein about essentially being kept as slaves for his pleasure, if you know what I mean. There's certain words, obviously I can't say for certain, I'll be demonetized if I say them, but he kept them trapped at his will on his private island that he owns and that nobody else can go to unless he invites them there. And he pretty much um, you know, made them do whatever he wanted and he made them do whatever he wanted with others as well. So the island's called Little St. James Island. It's in the Caribbean and a couple of decades ago, Jeff Epstein purchased it. People in the nearby areas started to notice that American flags were being put up, the trees were being cleared, buildings were being put there, security guards were patrolling the beach and obviously that is because he was now turning it into his own little creepy island. Um, if anybody remembers the book called The Most Dangerous Game, this is exactly what it reminds me of. So in The Most Dangerous Game, there's a guy and you know, I don't remember a lot about it, who he was or was he rich or whatever, but all I know is he had this area and he would bring people there as guests and then release them like into the wilderness and then chase them and hunt them. So this is pretty much what, what Jeff Epstein did in my opinion. The island's been given a lot of nicknames, the Island of Sin, Orgy Island, if anybody remembers from my Rui Pedro video, Parasite. Island and parasite is a code word for another word that I cannot say on my channel. But Jeff Epstein liked to call it Little Saint Jeffs because he was a narcissistic prick, in my opinion. So Little Saint James Island is located between St. Thomas and St. John's and it basically became his main area of residence. It's 72 acres, there's buildings there, you know, he had two offices on there, but there's also this weird building and it's a blue and white striped temple. So we're not sure what that was used for, allegedly. Uh, Jeff said it was so he could practice his classical piano because the acoustics in there were good, but yeah, we're not sure. There is a lot of speculation about what was on that island. It depends what sources you look into. Some will say, we don't know what was in the buildings. And some say that they do know what was in the buildings and there were these temple-like areas that had mattresses all over the floor that, you know, who, who knows what those were for. But what we do know is that Jeffrey Epstein was accused of flying in underage girls and then keeping them on the island. And when I say underage, I mean as young as the age of 12. He would fly them into St. Thomas and then put them in a ferry to bring them to his island. And this ferry was a boat that he owned and he called it the Lady Ghislaine. And we will talk about Ghislaine in a moment, but once they were there, these girls and women who came forward said that they were basically held hostage. One even said she tried to swim away from the island and she was picked up by a convoy of Jeff Epstein and his like men, his security guards, and they brought her back. Some of the girls said that he would keep their passports so they couldn't leave. A lot of uh, Jim Jones stuff going on here, if you ask me, but that's just my opinion. I don't want to disappear. So he's arrested once all these women start coming forward and you know, it always happens that way. Whether they're true allegations or they're false allegations, whenever one person comes forward, more will follow. And that's just feeling, you know, a strength in numbers kind of thing. And in this case, I 100% believe that the charges and the allegations made against Jeffrey Epstein are true. 
I can't say for sure if all the women coming forward are legitimate victims. It would be impossible for me to say that. I never want to victim shame. I never want to tell someone, um, you know, this didn't happen to you because it's not my experience, so that's not my place. But it's just in a legal standpoint, without all the information, being able to see and question people and, you know, kind of do an investigation. I can't say for sure if every single woman coming forward was actually a victim of Jeff Epstein, but I do believe that many of them were. So when he's arrested again this past July, right, it started to circulate. Like, who's he gonna turn on, basically? He's got this little black book where he keeps the names of all the powerful people that he knows and that he works with and that he has connections with. And this guy knows everybody. I mean, politics, Hollywood, Jeff Epstein had his fingers on every pie. Ugh. And it's kind of common sense to think, you know, Epstein had a lot of friends and he had this, this island, the secret sex island, and a lot of his friends went to this island. So if you kind of put two and two together, you kind of think to yourself, somebody else has to know and somebody else may have taken part in the things that he was doing. In fact, he himself has alluded many times to many people that he would have these girls do these things with other men, powerful men, important men, so that he could get it on camera. Cause, oh, did I forget to tell you? He's got hidden cameras everywhere, especially like in his Manhattan house. When they raided that, they found all these hidden cameras all over the place. So he's got hidden cameras everywhere. And then he'll take the recordings or the pictures and he'll label them with like the person's name or who was in the, the footage and like lock them in a safe so that he has them for blackmail in the future, allegedly. So everybody's speculating. He's got this huge network of powerful and important people. Is he gonna turn on somebody? Is he going to give the feds or whoever, the police, a bigger name than himself so that he can maneuver his way into a lighter sentence? It wouldn't be the first time that he'd found a way to turn a pretty serious charge, which is having relations with an underage girl into 13 months in a prison where essentially he just walked free for 75% of the time. It wouldn't be the first time that he'd found a way to, to get out of it or to make his life easier. So what's he gonna do now? Who's he gonna name? Who's he gonna turn in? That's what people were speculating. And they'll say that the people who were speculating this were conspiracy theorists. I don't like the term conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorist. I'm going to get demonetized now just for saying those two words, but I don't like the way that people say that in a negative light. Are there some conspiracies out there that are crazy and off the wall? Yes. Are they still fun to talk about and look into kind of like the ancient aliens thing? Like that's super fun to think about and look into. Do I hundred percent believe it? No, but I'll watch people talk about it and you know, watch them try to connect the dots and enjoy that for our entertainment purpose. But a conspiracy theory is just a theory about a possible conspiracy. And why is that a negative thing or why is that a bad thing or why does that suggest that the person who has this theory about a conspiracy is a crackpot or crazy or you know, just trying to stir the pot? It, it shouldn't be a negative connotation. We're humans, we're intelligent beings, and we should be allowed to formulate theories about conspiracies or otherwise in our own minds and share them with like-minded people without being made to feel stupid or like we're against our government. It's not really, um, it's not really fair. And I do believe that some conspiracy theories are dangerous and can be detrimental and can cause pain. But at the same time, where is the line drawn? Where do you say like, okay, this, this speech is dangerous to somebody else. Freedom of speech protects everything. A freedom of speech won't protect hate speech. Freedom of speech won't protect speech that intends to hurt somebody else or causes harm to somebody else. But typically conspiracy theories are, you know, just harmless people like us on the internet, just chatting about them and wondering about the possibilities. And the, the people who are in power and are concerned about conspiracy theories, if they're not true and they're harmless, why, why are they concerned? Pretty much. Anyway, sorry, let's get back to Epstein's black book. So he's got all these people in there. People are wondering who's he gonna turn on to try to basically make his life easier, which is what he does because he's a selfish and narcissistic person. We'll never know what Epstein was planning because on August 10th of this month, he took his own life while in the jail, in the custody of the prison. He took his own life in his jail cell 
And at first reports were coming out saying that he had been under 24 seven suicide watch when this happened. So obviously everybody was like, how, how, how do you commit suicide when you're on 24 seven suicide watch? How does that happen? The conspiracy theories started popping up online. So then reports came out and the report said, no, no, he wasn't on suicide watch at this moment. He'd been taken off of suicide watch, which also rose, you know, questions and red flags. Because if you have an inmate, especially a high profile inmate like Jeff Epstein, you're gonna wonder, why would he, after previously and recently trying to take his own life, be removed from suicide watch? So that was an issue. And then there was all sorts of, you know, outcry, like, well, where's the footage? You have cameras in prison. Where were the guards, etc.? So then all of this stuff just kind of fell into place, right? It was a perfect storm of coincidences that just so happened to leave Jeff Epstein completely alone and unmonitored and unsupervised for long enough for him to complete his task. The cameras in the prison, I think they weren't working or they were pointing the other way. Either way, there's no footage. The guards, they were working a lot of overtime that week and they were extremely tired. Some reports came out yesterday, I believe, that said they fell asleep. And there was supposed to have been another inmate with him. And that other inmate was kind of just like a security blanket. He'd be with Jeff Epstein in the cell so that if Jeff tried to do anything, he could, you know, try to stop it or call somebody who would stop it. Well, that inmate got transferred. So Jeff Epstein, alone in a cell, after being on a 24 seven watch, no guards around, no cameras looking at him. And he's able to have long enough to do this thing that he wanted to do. So he's gone, we'll never know. And what's most important about the fact that he's gone is not the conspiracy or the connections, although those things are important if they exist. What's important is there are a whole bunch of people who he victimized, allegedly, and they cannot face their abuser now, and he will not be brought to justice because he, he took his own life, allegedly. But surely the autopsy, this is medical, this is science, the autopsy will show what happened, if not exactly in 100% what happened, it'll at least tell us whether his wounds were self-inflicted or if there may have been foul play. So we gotta get something from the autopsy, right? Mm -mm, no, no, the chief medical examiner said that um, it, it's inconclusive and they're not able to, <laughs> to state what the cause of death is at this time. So that's obviously strange and suspicious in my opinion. Okay, so we've got this guy, Jeff Epstein, 2008, he like goes to prison for his crimes. You'd think when he got out of prison, people would kind of steer clear of him, right? You know, this is a convicted child parasite. Um, why would all his high society and rich and famous friends in politics and business and, and what have you, why would they want to hang out with him still? It really didn't happen that way. You know, Jeff Epstein, he's, he's a scrappy one. He wasn't raised with money or privilege. He came up, you know, from, you know, a middle class family and he made his own way in the world somehow, some way. He, he managed to make all these connections and make all this money, even though nobody's really sure how. You know, little St. Jeff, he was a survivor. So how deep did his roots and his connections go? Now, obviously, I mean, like I said, we can't talk about everything in this video, and I will leave several sources for you to peruse on your own. And if anybody wants to talk to me personally about this, I have plenty to say, and you can contact me on Instagram and we can chat. But I wanna to talk to you about some of the most important, in my opinion, and you know, what their connections to him are. So first of all, you've got British socialite, Ghislaine Maxwell. She's daughter of publishing tycoon, Robert Maxwell. She's been accused of assisting Epstein with his crimes, basically like a madam. Um, remember that the ferry he had, which would bring these underage girls to his island, allegedly, was named the Lady Ghislaine, and it was after Ghislaine Maxwell. And she was accused of many of the girls of basically procuring them for Epstein. So she's got her own legal problems going on right now, I'm sure. You've got Les Wexner, founder and CEO of L Brands, parent company to Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works. Epstein was his personal money manager and he served on the board of trustees of Wexner's foundation, the Wexner Foundation, which is Les Wexner's charitable foundation. Now, Les claims that he severed ties with Epstein 12 years ago. He said he has no knowledge of his crimes and you'll see a pattern here. Nobody has any knowledge of his crimes 
everybody that we talk about here, all these high profile people, they had no idea, which I'm sure it might be, it might be legitimate. They might have had no idea. That's, that's possible. But anyways, he says he has no idea what Epstein was doing and that Epstein had misappropriated funds from Les Wexner. So, you know, he, he's pretty much saying like, this guy stole from me. I had no idea what he was doing. I have no affiliation with this person. I wipe my hands clean. Please do not like attribute what he did to me, please. Like, I don't want any dirt on me. That's what I hear everybody saying pretty much. However, one of Epstein's accusers, one or two, I believe, I can't remember, so don't quote me, but I think, let's just say one to be safe. One of them said that she was assaulted by Epstein in Les Wexner's home, and also that huge ass mansion in Manhattan that Epstein lived in. Um, I don't even know if you call it a mansion. I would call it more of an estate. It's huge. But he acquired that from Les Wexner, and I don't believe that he paid for it. I mean, I heard reports that it was given to him for like a dollar or something. That could be not true but I would not have a hard time believing that it had just been given to him. Additionally, uh, one of the Boeing 727s that Epstein owned or flew had belonged initially to Les Wexner. We also have Alan Dershowitz, high profile attorney who was part of the legal team in 2007 that helped to gain Epstein his sweet deal. Dershowitz has also been accused by a woman, one of the women that was held by um, Epstein of assaulting her. So basically, Alan Dershowitz has always been a diehard like supporter and defender of Epstein, which I guess, you know, he was his lawyer, so he would have had to, but I, I think in the years that followed, he still kind of had his back, which makes me dislike him immensely. Additionally, I just found this, it posted, I believe just a couple of hours ago, this article, um, it says, attorney Alan Dershowitz, whose past work on behalf of accused sex trafficker, Jeffrey Epstein, has done significant damage to his reputation, will once again take up the cause of defending someone accused of enslaving children. The Jerusalem Post reports that Dershowitz is slated to participate in a mock trial at New York's Temple Emanuel this fall, in which he will defend the brothers of biblical figure Joseph against charges that they kidnapped their sibling and sold him into slavery. So this is like a mock trial, but Dershowitz has taken the part of defending these people who kidnapped biblical figure Joseph and basically sold him into slavery because they were jealous of um, their father's affection for him. And his job in this mock trial is to defend them and like get them off. <laughs> New Jersey Governor Chris Christie will be serving as the prosecution. So, <laughs> so ridiculous. So there's like a flyer that goes with it and it says the charges, kidnapping and child trafficking. And then it says defense, Alan Dershowitz and prosecution, Chris Christie. <laughs> I can't do this guys. This is ludicrous. Do these people have nothing better to do with their time? This was obviously canceled in the wake of what happened. Just recently, just a couple of hours ago, it's been canceled because it seemed to be in bad taste. Yes. A lot of people had a problem with Alan Dershowitz because of the fact that he would defend his buddy, Jeff Epstein, by slandering the name and the reputations of the women who were, you know, accusing him. And it, it sucked and it was a, a crappy and shitty thing for him to do because they were pretty much underage children when this happened. So he was basically blaming them. You know, that's always the go-to kind of thing in a sexual assault trial. The defense attorney will say, well, she was wearing a short skirt or she was asking for it or, you know, she was flirting with him. They, they'll do that and it's just disgusting and unethical and immoral and disgusting. It's evil. So people don't like him for that as well as other things. And I will put links for everything in the description box so you guys can peruse and, and get lost down that rabbit hole. Another high profile figure that Epstein has often been associated with is Prince Andrew, Duke of York. Now, many of the women who came forward, they accused Prince Andrew of assaulting them as well. And that Jeff Epstein pretty much, you know, made this all happen. Like he procured these women specifically for Prince Andrew. Of course, like once again, this is all alleged. These are just accusations. I'm not saying it's true. Prince Andrew, Duke of York, he has completely denied this as has his entire family. So please, I'm not blaming the royal family in any way. God save the queen. But Prince Andrew and Jeff Epstein, they were tight. They were buddies. And after Epstein went to prison in 2008, 
and he got out, Prince Andrew re remained being friends with him and, you know, remained loyal to him, even though his family was like, you gotta cut ties with this guy, like, he's not good. He is not a good look for us. Prince Andrew basically told them like, you know, he's my friend and I'm loyal and being a loyal friend is a positive trait, which I completely agree with Prince Andrew. Like that, that is admirable. I mean, it's a little bit different though when the person you are being a loyal friend to admitted to and pled guilty to charges of having relations with an underage girl it becomes just a little creepy then. And then it, it makes me feel like the person who remains loyal and remains friends with this person may agree with the practices that they did in order to get them into prison. And so that's why they don't have a problem with remaining friends and remaining loyal after this person's out of prison because they don't have a problem with what they did to get into prison, if that makes sense, allegedly. Now, one of the women who's accused Jeff Epstein and accused Prince Andrew, I'm not gonna say their names. I don't wanna do that. Like, you can find them, but I'm not gonna say the names of these victims just because it's, it's not my place to do so. But one of these victims who accused Prince Andrew and Epstein, um, there were pictures of Prince Andrew with her, and she was 17 at the time. This was in London, and I believe um, age of consent in London is over 17. So technically, like even though he's been accused of having relations with underage girls, there is no proof at this point that, that he has. Only that he's been with Epstein, and Epstein has often been with underage girls, so there might be an affiliation. He's gone to Epstein's island several times, and like I said, they're buddies. Obviously, Buckingham Palace has made a statement saying that all of these allegations are false, there is no proof, it's it's not true, he's done nothing wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's possible. It's also possible that he may have done something wrong, but you know, it's not one of those things that you can really make a statement on without knowing the story and having the evidence and the proof and the facts in front of you. So, so I'll just leave it at that. Oh, did I mention that picture with Prince Andrew and the girl um, in London? Ghislaine Maxwell's in that picture too, just happily smiling, just having a great time. Donald Trump, our president, has also had affiliations with Jeff Epstein. Um, he once referred to him as a terrific guy. He said he'd known Jeff for 15 years, but apparently he had cut ties with him because when um, Jeff Epstein used to go to Trump's Mar-a-Lago or Mar-a-Lago, I don't know what it's called, his resort, uh, he was a member there, but one of the women who worked there basically told Trump that she had been, you know, assaulted by Epstein. So Trump kicked him out and like didn't let him come back. But he's been on his jets or his plane a couple of times. There's no proof that Donald Trump ever went to his island. Did I mention that Jeff's plane? Jeff Epstein's plane, it's called the Lolita Express. Did I mention that? If I didn't, I should have, I'm sorry. It's called the Lolita Express. Talk about hiding in plain sight though, right? So Trump said in July, Jeff Epstein was not somebody that I respected. I threw him out. In fact, I think the great James Patterson, who's a member of Mar-a-Lago, made a statement yesterday that many years ago, I threw him out. I'm not a fan of Jeffrey Epstein, he said. Trump loves using that term, I'm not a fan. Um, anyways, James Patterson is involved in this because he did this, he wrote this book exposing like Jeff Epstein and, and all that stuff. And I'll link the book in the description box. I haven't read it yet, but I really want to listen to it, the audiobook. Like I said, Trump and Epstein were friends for a while. Trump went to Epstein's house for dinner and you know Epstein went to Trump Tower for dinner and all that jazz, but as of now, there's no proof that exists that Trump ever visited the island. However, former president Bill Clinton he, he did visit the island. What bothers me is Bill Clinton lied about his affiliation with Jeff Epstein, and I get it, like you don't want to be like affiliated with this guy, it looks bad, but when something is so easy to figure out and, and proof is so easy to find if you know where to look for it, it's just a bad idea to lie about something like that. So he said he'd only been on Jeff Epstein's jet the Lolita Express. He said in the years of 2002, he'd only been on there four times. Then it came out, oh no, it was actually 11 times he'd been on the jet. And then it came out again, once flight plans were looked into, that that number was actually doubled. So he'd actually been on the Lolita Express 22 times, I believe, and it looked like a handful of these times. His Secret Service agents were not present and um, many other women were visible on that flight manifest. So, you know, do with that what you will. 
It says here, trips between 2001 and 2003 included extended junkets around the world with Epstein and fellow passengers identified on manifest by their initials or first names, including Tatiana. The tricked out jet earned its nickname because it was reportedly outfitted with a bed where passengers could have relations with young girls. Official flight logs filed with the Federal Aviation Administration show Clinton traveled on some of the trips with as many as 10 U.S. Secret Service agents. However, on five leg Asia trips between May 22nd and May 25th of 2002, not a single Secret Service agent is listed. So through a subpoena from an unrelated case, they found a bunch of State Department emails. And in these emails, it was stated that Bill Clinton visited Jeff Epstein's private island, I believe it was 20 times, or more than 20 times. And Hillary Clinton went there at least six times. What is Hillary Clinton doing there? So weird. And now both of the Clintons, obviously, I believe they deny ever having been on the island, but there is reports in these State Department emails saying that they were there. So while we're still on the topic of the Clintons, I want to explain to you that the Clintons have had many scandals of their own, as you probably know if you're familiar with politics. But one of the most important, and I think in regards to this, this kind of situation especially, is the Laura Silsby connection. Now, on January 29th, 2010, Laura Silsby was arrested at the Haitian border. She was trying to smuggle children out. There was 33 children. She said she was trying to take them out and put them in an orphanage in the Dominican, even though she didn't have proper documentation. Silsby is the former director of the New Life Children's Refuge. Um, their plan allegedly was to rescue orphans from Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Now, I mean, that, that sounds great, I guess, but there was reports that some of these children weren't even orphans, that they had families. So they'd basically been taken, allegedly. There's reports of that, but it's so very hard to find out the truth when it comes to politics and people who don't want the truth to be found. So we don't really know. Regardless, she's trying to take 33 children out of a country and bring them into another country without documentation. So it's basically kidnapping. Now the lawyer that Laura Silsby retained after her arrest, his name was George Torres. George Torres was arrested in connection with an international smuggling ring that trafficked children and women from Central America and Haiti into the United States. He was indicted in 2003 on charges of conspiring to smuggle people from Central America into the United States through Canada. Basically, he was hiding out in Canada under a different name after a 1999 bank fraud conviction and the US government was not able to locate him until 2003. But then he popped up in the media representing Laura Silsby after he's basically been like hiding out as a fugitive in a different country. He pops up and he's representing this woman who's trying to essentially allegedly kidnap children and bring them to a different country. He was extradited, he pled guilty, and then he was sentenced, I believe, to one to three years. At that time, he was wanted by four different countries in connection with trafficking girls and women from other countries. His wife was arrested for holding girls captive in Nicaragua. So you got Laura Silsby, she's being held in Haiti still. Um, her lawyer, some criminal who also has sketchy connections, he's, he's done with, and she's still there. And then suddenly, Bill Clinton sends a special envoy. To, to basically go to her aid. Miraculously, Laura Silsby's charges were reduced to arranging irregular travel, which she had to serve six months in Haiti, and then she was free to just go home. What's she doing now? She went back to the United States, she got married, she changed her name. She's now vice president of marketing for the company Alert Sense. Alert Sense works with the federal government on FEMA's integrated public alert and warning system, including the Amber Alerts when kidnappings occur. So, I mean, I'm not telling you what to think or what to believe, right? You just kind of look, you gotta look at the stuff and there's more stuff, but you gotta look at the stuff and then kind of see what could be possible and what the story tells. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton have received money and donations from Jeffrey Epstein, 50,000 here, 25,000 there, which is just pennies to Epstein, right? It's like nothing. He's like taking quarters out of his pocket and handing it to the kids for the gumball machine. That's how Epstein felt about giving the Clintons that much money. Actor Kevin Spacey was also known to pail around with Bill Clinton and Epstein. They like to go on Epstein's jet together a lot. So Kevin Spacey's a hugely problematic person, as you know, sadly, because 
I loved House of Cards. There's so much more, guys, but this video has, has probably gone on long enough. I wish I could talk to you for hours about it because it's so interesting. Not necessarily true. Is there or was there a conspiracy to, to take out Jeff Epstein so that he wouldn't spill the beans about what he knew or what he knew about who he knew? It's possible, everything's possible, right? I'm not trying to tell you what to believe. I'm trying to give you the opportunity to look outside of what you're being told. And this isn't even kind of a in the shadows theory. If you Google it, even if you Google it, not just using Yahoo, but if you Google it, there are you know, people out there who don't believe that Epstein killed himself. People who are you know, high up, in government and politics and they're saying like you know if anybody helped him or if anybody had anything to do with this you know we're coming after you uh, they're also seeing anybody who knew about his going ons before he got arrested or if anybody was involved in that like we're coming for you you're not safe just because he's gone you know so there's people out there threatening these things and who knows if they'll follow through but the fact is when you're connected and you're powerful and you know important people who are connected and powerful, you have more options that are available to you. You have more wiggle room when it comes to breaking the law. Before he died, Jeff Epstein would sometimes talk to reporters and he'd say, he'd say strange things. He'd say things like, you know, this whole like age thing where you can't have relations with somebody who's, you know, under the certain age. This is just like a modern construct. This is uh, something that we've just created in this country in this time. And it wasn't common to have these kinds of rules and, you know, restrictions on sexual activity before in the past and in history, people used to do this with young kids all the time and it was completely normal, you know? And he reminds me a lot of Roman Polanski because Roman Polanski has said similar things. Jeff Epstein also said things like, um, you know, when you're in the real world, like you're told what you can feel or what you can think or what you can do. But here on my island, I can feel that I can be myself and have my own thoughts and, you know, do whatever I want kind of thing. Like he felt like that island was his own private lawless society, basically. Like he was the emperor of this temple filled island where he could bring whatever girls there he wanted and do whatever he wanted with them. He could take pictures of them. He could take pictures and video of them with other people so that he could file that away and hold it against those other people to ensure that he remained rich and powerful and above the law. And this stuff happens. You know, we would be stupid to deny it. Just like with the whole Olivia Jade scandal when people were all up in arms, like her parents paid to get her into college. This is crazy. No, it's not crazy. It happens every single day. And people who are in positions of power and have connections, they get away with things. They get away with things all the time. It's sad because there's a lot of women out there that Jeff Epstein hurt. And you know he basically treated these women like property. And he had help, he had assistants who came forward and claimed that they would procure girls for him. He had one in uh, New York, he had two in Florida, and they would basically be responsible for going out and finding these girls or going and getting a specific girl that Epstein requested to bring to him. He had Ghislaine Maxwell working for him, allegedly like a madam bringing girls to him, grooming them and preparing them pretty much for a life as, as a slave and an object. And it pisses me off that there's men and women out there who view people as disposable. They think if they have enough money and their family has enough money and they have enough connections, and they have enough power that they're better than other people and everybody else is there pretty much for their pleasure or their entertainment. And when they're done with them, they can just toss them aside. And that, that bothers me. Sex trafficking is a huge, huge, huge issue. And I have to wonder how it has become such an incredibly large business without the help of those who do have the power and the money to make it happen and allow it to continue to go on unseen. And I'm not saying that it's anybody or in our country, you know, there's powerful people with money in other countries, but there's people out there who must be facilitating with their money, with their connections, the ability of others to take people out of their homes and bring them to different countries so that other people can use them. I mean, this whole thing is a touchy subject because it can be very polarizing and it can be political, but it really doesn't matter 
or pertain to what side of politics you fall on, liberal or conservative, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. It comes down to a fact of right and wrong. And the things that Jeff Epstein did were wrong and now he'll never face them. It doesn't matter what you believe in. This isn't about sides or political parties. We should come together as humans, liberal and conservative alike, and you, you don't know what kind of politics I believe in and I purposely make it that way because I don't deal with politics too much. I think politics was almost invented sometimes to make us turn on each other and I don't want to have any part in that but as people as humans as a society we can come together and say what happened to these girls was wrong and Jeff Epstein should have been held accountable and if other people participated in this with him they should also be held accountable because money and power shouldn't buy you immunity from doing things that are wrong and illegal and harmful to others period thank you guys so much for listening by the time you see this, I'll probably be on my way to Cape Cod or in Cape Cod, but um, I am I'm looking into a case while I'm there and it's very interesting. It's a good case. So I'll be ready to record as soon as I get back and give you some more amazing content. I hope, I hope you think it's amazing. Thank you so much. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Bye.